worship prayer in the service of the Lord's Day, Baptism of the Lord, Sunday after Epiphany, the 9th of January, 2022, Community Church of Syosset. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we hadn't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then Paul said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Our, Our God, God is, is with us. us. Amen. Amen.
Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over mighty waters. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let us praise the Lord. You proclaim Jesus, your beloved Son. With the baptized of every time and generation, may we say yes to your call to repentance and be led to the light of abundance we experience in your kinship and your love. Amen. Friends, this morning we remember the baptism of the Lord. And this is an opportunity for us, whether we're uh, the, the, the very few that are gathered here in church today, or those who are following on the live stream, it's, it's been printed out, I hope you can follow it. It's a renewal of baptism vows, something that I think is well for all of us to do. So let us engage in this uh, ritual of renewal of vow of baptismal promises, I should say, uh, that is given to us by the United Church of Christ from their book of worship. Jesus, baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist, became living water for us and embraces all of us. Jesus embraces those who are poor, oppressed, marginalized, and all others who come seeking. We follow Jesus with our baptism, marking a starting place for a new life and new ways of being. We join Jesus in love and service. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to see and feel and hear again the vows of baptism. Let us silently pray.
we recollect in our hearts and our spirits this mystery of baptism. We pray, Almighty God, that you will help us to devote ourselves once again to living and loving after the manner of Jesus. Friends, I ask you, do you renew and affirm the promises made at your baptism? I do. I do. do you recognize the call of God to be God's people always? I do. Do you embrace the way of Jesus in faith and ministry? I do. Do you accept the nurture of the Holy Spirit who renews your spirit each day? Do you accept and embrace others who seek a liberating faith in God? I do. In renewing your baptismal vows, remember your baptism as a mark of acceptance and welcome into the care of Christ's church, where you may begin again your Christian faith and life. Let us pray. O oh God, we rejoice in your grace. Given and received. We thank you that you claim us, that you wash us, strengthen us, and guide us, that you empower us. To live a life worthy of our calling. In the way of Jesus, make us as water in a dry and thirsty world. Establish us to be places of refreshment. Root us and nurture us in love that with all your people that we may rightly and justly serve you fill us with your goodness that our lives may overflow in service and love amen
Our lesson this morning is taken from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance. For the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan. Confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture to our understanding. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, in the in the old days, in the churches, well, some of the churches that I preached in, we didn't wear robes and things, and so I would always make sure to wear my camel's hair jacket on uh, on this day because of the reading. Uh, certainly, John the Baptist was uh, was a, was a fellow who was dressed. I think what they were trying to say is pretty much in rough rags. Uh, he was out there in the desert. Our sermon title today is Dry Clean Only. Okay, now you might wonder, what does that have to do with baptism for us? That's kind of like, uh, come on, we have these rituals, right? You know, here we have, you know, water and, you know, what, what, what is this with dry clean only? We use water when we baptize, you know? Some of us sprinkle, some of us have been immersed fully, you know? It, well, wanted to ask us to take a reflection on what baptism means for us. Now, we have friends that used to be very dominant in this area of Long Island, um, that uh, fewer these days, much fewer, still here. Has anyone heard of the Quakers? Yeah, they run like Friends Academy and the Quaker Meetings House and things like that, right? Yeah, you've heard of the Quakers. Guilford College and all, all, of, those, all of those great places of learning. Uh, did you know that Quakers do not baptize with water? They do not baptize with water. And so my sermon title is actually uh, taken from a humorous but interesting book of theology uh, from the Quaker perspective called Dry Clean Only. What did they mean and why did they do it? So if you go way, way, way back in time, hundreds of years ago, the churches whether they were Roman Catholic or they were Anglican, uh, you, you know, or, or they were very formal, okay, the churches, very formal. Uh, people did things in, you know, kind of rigorous ways. They didn't understand the language necessarily. Uh, it, was, it was a time when people would present their babies for baptism and their feeling was, their teach what they were taught, whether it was from home or from others, is that, well, if you don't want your baby to die and go to hell, you better get them baptized. Did you know that that's still a pretty current belief uh, today, even to this day? You know, um, that, uh, when I, it's a current belief. Christians have believed these things and many things, and different things than we believe today, and we believe different things than our ancestors did, all throughout the history of the church. Now, George Fox, who was the founder of the Quakers, was preaching about the same time that Menos and the people that were founding, the Mennonites and the Amish and the Anabaptists and all those folks, they were preaching around the same time. Because there was this real resurgence of popular belief 
you know, people were reading more, scripture was becoming available, printing was becoming available, whether the Bible was fully printed in English yet, you know, right from the start, biblical tracts were very popular. Um, and people were reading scripture and talking about scripture, and they were not getting served by church very well in many ways. It was just very formal. Some people thought it was ritualistic. Some people thought it bordered on the magical which is not what they thought Jesus was talking about, you know. So George Fox said, all of these external things, you know, Holy Communion and matrimony and uh, baptism and anointings and you know, all of the sacramental actions and things like that that are external, well, they don't have any spiritual effect. The only thing that has spiritual effect is the Holy Spirit working in you. And if you sit quietly and listen, the Holy Spirit will emerge from your heart. If you sit quietly amongst friends, the Holy Spirit will speak through them and you'll hear the Holy Spirit speaking through your voice. The baptism that you want is the inward baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is what Jesus called for. Jesus didn't need to be baptized by water, and since the resurrection, you don't either. What you need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is an interior experience that is expressed in an exterior life of love and generosity. Very powerful preaching, right? It almost sounds persuasive. I'm not saying we don't baptize. We baptize. At the same time, we had these other church reformers who were saying that, well, look, you know, you shouldn't be baptized unless you're a fully grown up believer and you can make a commitment to Christ, right? We have that now amongst many, many conservative Christians in this country, right? That they believe that only a person who is of mature age, who can make a decision to dedicate their lives to following Jesus Christ ought to be baptized. So what's happened? If you look across much of the, uh, of the world, of the Baptist world, you would call it, you'll find that at exactly the same age kids are confirmed in the mainline churches, kids are baptized in the Baptist world. 13 years old, you know. It's like, how much of a commitment have they made at that time? I mean, I know how much of a commitment my confirmands make when they're confirmed, <laughs> which is appropriate for their age, right? But, you know, has their life turned around? Has the Holy Spirit truly come within them? It goes even more interestingly. For some folks, they will say, unless you are born again, right? You've heard this. You ever hear anybody ask you if you're born again? You know, for, you know, mainliners like ourselves, it's like, well, we were born again at baptism, right? Uh, the, we, we might say, like, Okay, have you been born again? Well, if you're born again, you need to be baptized after you've been born again. But if we read the scripture today, when did the Holy Spirit come and wake up and born again the, the people that had been baptized under John but didn't get the Holy Spirit? It was after they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So the baptism actually comes first if you look at the scripture. So it's, it's, it's interesting and fascinating how this ritual of baptism has become understood in a whole variety of different ways, of which we should all be respectful. Whether you have the Quakers who are dry clean only, you know, whether you have the folks that, you know, no, you got to go down to the river, and maybe you need to be dunked backwards before you're dunked forwards. I don't know. They, uh, they have modes to it that are very important to some folks. They have a whole theology about it, which I'm, I don't claim to be expert in, but very, very important. There are other folks like us that say, well, what you need is two things, water, and you need to say something like Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay? You need to say something like that, or at least mean that. Lots of different understandings of baptism. And then, to make it even more interesting, is the idea that goes way back, way, way back, early church. And here we're talking about mostly the Roman, but also much of the Greek-speaking world, their experience. Back to the days of persecution. Remember that? Christians 
prior to Constantine were persecuted, right? And they didn't all believe the same thing at the time. They, they believed lots of different stuff about Jesus, and they, they were not together on the same page at all. But they did have a process that was very common throughout the very ancient pre-Constantine church world. They would get ready to celebrate Easter. And the people who were interested in joining them, in other words, were willing to have their names written on a list, which was dangerous because they were persecuted, right? You don't want your name on a list if you're being persecuted. If you are willing to join us and become a part of us, then you had to go through a process. Okay, so you've already been attracted to us, you've already heard some street preaching, you've already heard some public preaching, but you, you haven't gotten the whole deal yet. You would go through a process at l very least during the period of Lent, probably much longer, and you would become a catechumen, catechesis. You would learn all the different elements of the faith that they could teach you. But then, before you could share in the Holy Communion meal, okay, that was being served together, you had to be baptized. And often the building was even different. You see that in churches now, how the baptism font is sometimes in a different part of the church. Sometimes it's a completely different building. They would bring you and they would baptize you. The men would baptize the men, the women would baptize the women. You would be dressed in white clothing and this would happen over the, the course of the night before Easter Sunday morning and people would be in the church praying and praying and praying for you, keeping a vigil, staying up all night. Some churches still do that. And then on Easter Sunday morning, after you emerged from the baptism, you would be led over by the elders into the church building itself and you would share in the Lord's Supper for the first time and distribute the leftovers to the poor afterwards. This was an ancient expression of baptism, of becoming a member of the church, embracing a faith that is mysterious to you, being drawn into a community that was now devoted to you and you to it, that was pledged to service to the community. So baptism from this very earliest time also became the sign of church membership. So if we ask, are you a member of a church? You, pre you typically don't say yes unless you are what? Baptized, Baptized right? That, that, that's the key for being a Christian. Now, where does this power of baptism come from? Where does this change come from? You know, we don't know how much the Holy Spirit is, you know, having a particular impact on a baby when they're baptized. I mean, sometimes they cry, sometimes they giggle. We're not quite so sure. There was a wonderful movie. Um, I, recommend it, I recommend you watch it someday with Robert Duvall called Tender Mercies. Does anybody know the movie? Beautiful movie. And after he was baptized, the, his, uh, I guess, stepson asked him, feel any different? And he said, not yet. But they expected they would. The idea that following this experience of a baptism, devotion, commitment, inclusion in the church, having standing with all that it means to be a member of the church, well, that, that would make all the difference. And so for those of us who have been baptized, I think that's probably most of the folks here, maybe not everybody, for those of us who are baptized and members of the church, we need from time to time to ask, what does this mean for me? Did this action taken when I was a teenager or by my parents when I was an infant, or this action that maybe I might take in the future, what difference does this make for me? Well, I imagine if we're bothering to tune into a live stream or watch a video of a, of a local congregational church service, or if we came to church on this morning, you know, in the midst of this pandemic and the weather, that we already are saying church matters. 
Church matters to me. And I think if we can say, not only does church matter to me, but what church, the way church matters is that in it, I will be nurtured and cultivated to live according to the way Jesus showed us. Because isn't that what we're pledging in baptism? I am not one who preaches that you need to be fearful of going to hell if you're not baptized. And I think everybody here who knows me and has listened to me preach and teach knows that, you know, I, I don't think that's useful. I'm not, I, I don't even believe that that is so. I believe in this loving, merciful God. But then you'd have to ask, well, but Forrest, why do we do it? Why is it so important? It's important because in the ritual that we take, we did what Jesus did. Was Jesus baptized? He was. And so we too say, if Jesus can be baptized, so can we. And with all deference to, to George Fox and, 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 and our friends who are dry, clean only at the Quaker meeting houses, yes, it is true that Jesus' resurrection made all the difference in the world. But we are baptized in obedience to the scripture, which calls on us to be baptized, not only to repent, but to be converted, that our manners may reflect the mind of Christ. Because that is the mark of salvation from God. Now, can anybody baptize anybody? This is a bone of contention. We'll take this from the Roman Catholic world. How about that? They're, they're pretty good with rules and regulations, huh? They think it through? There are, in the New York area, tens of thousands of people who have been baptized as infants in danger of death in New York area hospital emergency rooms by Jewish doctors and nurses who do not believe in Jesus. Did you know that? It is true. And do you know what the church thinks about that? Are those baptisms valid? Yes, they are. Now, you can go to church and they'll fulfill the ceremonies and they'll go through a whole ceremony and things like that. But the date of the baptism is the date that that doctor or nurse, even though they might be an unbeliever, tried to do what the church intended out of respect for that child and their family. Because the saving act of the baptism is not in the rectitude of the minister. <laughs> it's not even in the particular right-mindedness of the community where it happens. The power of baptism to call one as God's own child specifically out as a member of the church is God's power. Now, when we celebrate baptism, you know, most of the time we try to celebrate it in a church, preferably on a Sunday morning, right? If, if we possibly can. Why? Well, it builds up the community. It reminds us there's a new generation coming. Parents and grandparents like it. There are extra people in the pews. Is that a good enough reason? Well, it's not a bad reason. But it's also because the church represents this human endeavor to cultivate the teachings of Jesus as applied in our lives. So that as we trust this child will grow into eternity, that their lives will be written into the eternal fabric of the universe, that they will live that life lovingly the way Jesus taught us to live it in a church that claims them, where they can be devoted. Well, that's worth celebrating. And following Jesus' example, we celebrate it with water in his name.
and pray for the Holy Spirit. Whether we're dry clean only, or we use drips or immersion, it's the Holy Spirit that lives through us, celebrating our conversion to the manners of Christ. May God bless our reading of Holy Scripture this morning. Brothers and sisters, we certainly have prayers this morning. Um, our rose on, on the altar uh, was brought by Karen. We are all in sympathy and solidarity with her in her grief. Let us pray. Almighty God, we lift up Muriel Webert and we give you thanks for her life and for her legacy. We pray that you will receive her into eternity. We pray for her daughter Karen, and her sister, and all those who loved her and knew her, that they may be comforted by your saints and may comfort one another in the hope of eternal life. We pray to the Lord. Um, an update, Bob Fentress remains in the hospital as of last night. I spoke to Muriel, uh, not Muriel, uh, Emma, Anna, Anna, uh, Bob's wife, and uh, Anna said that uh, he, his oxygen was back up and he was making more sense on the phone and they think he's doing better. So this is good, this is good. So, uh, and Anna herself uh, is, is says she's, she's feeling fine, so she's uh, mostly asymptomatic. So uh, we just pray for them in their household. For Bob, that he may recover and return to his beloved home and wife and to us quickly. We pray to the Lord. And for Anna, who is so worried, and our hearts go out to her, we pray to the Lord. We understand that uh, George Pratt has uh, a bad cold, and we hope that's all it is. I spoke to him this morning. He sends everybody his love. Uh, he's just not feeling up to coming into church today. Um, and uh, so uh, let's pray that everything is good for George and for Sue, um, and that they will be back to us. For George and Sue and for their health, we pray to the Lord. Um, I would like to uh, pray for my high school uh, uh, class. Uh, we lost yet another uh, classmate just this week, uh, Andy Boyers, and uh, we've lost too many, and they're all my age. So for my high school class, we pray to the Lord. Lord. Are there any other uh, prayers this morning? Uh, yes, Jimmy. For my cousin uh, Nancy's husband Jim Gemetta down in South Carolina, he's got a very severe illness and has uh, home hospice at, at this point. So uh, we're keeping him in our prayers. 
Jemetta. Jim Jemetta. Jim Jemetta. For Jim Jemetta, for his loved ones and for his family at this time of life that seems to be the coming to a fulfillment. We pray for them, Lord, for strength and courage. We pray that they will be treated tenderly and that they will find some comfort in their love for one another and in hope in you. We pray to the Lord. Robert? For my friend Tom and his, in the awful plight in which he finds himself at present. Almighty God, we lift up Tom and the, his, his circumstances. We pray, Almighty God, that you will be with him, that you will strengthen him, that you'll give him wisdom, that you will help others to help him and lead others to help him and that he can receive that help. And we pray, Almighty God, that you will hold him in the palm of your hands. We pray to the Lord. Are there other prayers this morning? I would uh, lift up uh, the teachers and students that are in complicated situations in schools now, uh, those who are being directly affected by the coronavirus, either by having to stay home, being infected, being afraid of being infected, whether their schools stay open or closed, and the dreadful responsibility this places on administrators who really don't know what they're doing but are doing their best. We pray, Almighty God, for those in schools and other organizations that have this, this awesome administrative challenge. We pray that you will inspire us with wisdom and with courage and with prudence. We pray to the Lord. And Almighty God, we pray for our country. We pray for a sense of national unity. We pray for a strengthening of our devotion and commitment to the rule of law. We pray for all those who are charged to govern us and to represent us in government. We beseech you mightily to be their help, to stir up within their conscience the mind of Christ. We pray to the Lord. We pray today in the midst of the epidemic, of course, for all of the people that are involved in hospitals, especially in those areas where the hospitals are under intense pressure, all of those who are working to care for the ill, all those who are, have had elective surgeries and treatments delayed, all those who feel at risk, and all those who live in fear. Lord, we pray for an end to this plague. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord our prayer. Are there other prayers this morning? I entrust to all of us here the, uh, the, the list of our prayer list and printed in our bulletin. Let us seek the prayers that God is stirring up in our hearts, the prayers that do not yet have words, the prayers that are private or secret, the prayers that we have promised others.
so we are bold to pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. and pray for God's blessing. <clears throat> May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God's people say, Amen. God, God is, is with us. us. Amen. We invite uh, the president of our board of stewards to make an important corporate announcement. Robert Owen. Good morning. A brief reminder, we will have our annual congregational meeting via Zoom on uh, the 30th of this month at 11.30 a.m. I've already sent you your Zoom invitation. I'll send another on the 16th and again on that morning. So it will be in your email someplace. And lastly, um, a request from Bill Chabina to, for birthday greetings belatedly to Don Meyer, a longtime member of the congregation. He grew up in the congregation 
as did many of us, and now lives in South Carolina. So happy birthday to you, Don. See you all next week. You know, I think I've seen Don on the, str on the Facebook streaming. So, Ren, could you, could you play it for us? Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning, and uh, whether it's on the video later today or on Facebook streaming or here in the congregation, uh, we, we pray to maintain a faithful ministry in the community. So thank you for your support. And Bible study continues every Wednesday at noon, so if you want to hop in, give us a call. Um, Moira is finishing up Revelations, and uh, we've just started the book of James, so there, you have a choice if you're interested. Just let me know. That's, that's Wednesdays at noon. God bless you, and have a beautiful day.